Hi, I'm Belinda Luscombe. I'm an editor at large at Time Magazine. Chris Carl's a former Navy SEAL. He's also quite possibly the most lethal sniper in American military history. And he's here today to face a little smattering of friendly fire with 10 questions at Time Magazine. Mr. Kyle, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, we've got this new book, American Sniper. Isn't that kind of not done amongst you special operations guys to talk about your, your, your stuff? Yes, it is kind of frowned upon. So why did you decide to do the book? I wanted to be able to get it out about not the sacrifices that the military members make, but the sacrifices that their families have to go through about the single mothers now raising the children and doing all the day-to-day -day house chores. But then also stories about my guys who deserve to be out there. They didn't get the Medal of Honor, so you don't know about them, but they died heroes and people should know about them. Uh, I believe that number is 160 is the sort of number of confirmed yes, sniper kills. Can you tell me what, explain what it is to have a confirmed sniper kill? Uh, well, while you're on your sniper rifle, you take a shot and the guy goes down and you have to have witnesses verify that he is dead. And does it get recorded as part of the battle damage assessment or? Every time we'd come back, we'd have to fill out an assessment of what happened throughout the day, the time, the place, the caliber used, the distance he was, what exactly he was doing, where he was standing, what he was wearing. It's all into detail. So, and there's that somewhere, we can't get them out of the Navy, but somewhere there's 160 of those forms with your name on them. Yes, ma'am. What goes through your mind when you're shooting a, a, a guy, it's usually a guy? The first time of killing someone, it, you're not even sure you can do it. I mean, you think you can, but you never know until you're actually put in that position and you do it. And then you double thinking yourself, like, can I really do this? And am I going to be okay? And then you're asking your leadership, am I clear it hot to be able to do this? Am I going to be in trouble? You know, this guy's really bad. And then you're worried when you get home, are the politicians going to hang you out to dry and put you on trial for murder? The, the first kill that you write about in the book, you actually kill a woman. And she has in one hand uh, the hand of her toddler, and in the other hand she has a grenade. Was that the hardest of the kills you had to do? Yeah, I had to do it to protect the Marines, so do you want to lose your own guys or would you rather take one of them out? Do you have two sets of kind of heads in that you have your I'm back in America head and your I'm at war head? You're two different people. You turn it on and turn it off. You a little more aggressive when you're at work, and then when you come home, you relax and try to be the different person. And my wife always said that when I came home from work, I'd take my cape off and <laughs> put it on the door because I'd stub my toe or break my toe or something at home. But at work, I was fine. Does your wife still have to say your name before she gets back into bed? <laughs> <laughs> it's not as bad, but that was even before I was in the military. I've always been extremely jumpy when I'm asleep. And the reason your wife has to say your name before she gets back into bed? I will come up swinging. <laughs> so <laughs> it depends on how tired. If I'm out cold, then uh, you can ring the doorbell and I'll be asleep. I have to ask this question, but are there any kills you regret? No. Not at all. Because they, you feel like it was either you killed them or they killed other Americans. Yes, ma'am. You know, you say in your book, actually, that most, and I think I'm quoting him, most Americans can't handle the reality of war and the reports they, they sent back, the reports being the journalists, didn't help us at all. Which actually sounds a lot like Jack Nicholson and A Few Good Men. Did you realize that? You can't handle the <laughs> truth. Is that, is that how you feel, that yes, Americans just can't? See, we should just, you're on Jack's side in this one. Yes, ma'am. You, you do not think. For the most part, the public is very soft. You live in a dream world. You have no idea what goes on on the other side of the world, that the harsh realities that these people are doing to themselves and then to our guys. And there are certain things that need to be done to take care of them. Now, if people, but if people did start out with the impression before they had read your book, that you were a, uh, that a person who had killed upwards of 150 other people was a violent person, um, maybe a bloodthirsty person. I, I'm not sure that the book would free them of that feeling. 
I really don't care what they think of me. I mean, I've got my family, I've got my friends, I'm not trying to make new friends. And the people who, if you actually spend time with me, you find out I'm just a fun-loving guy. Now, I, yes, I have been trained to be a little more aggressive if I need to be, but I don't go around thumping people. If you never got to kill another person again, would you be okay with that? I'm fine. I don't have to kill to live. But you were good at it. I was decent at it. What if killing people turns out to be the thing that you were better at than anything? Oh, no, that's not true. I'm a better husband and father than I was a killer. I mean, I've got a job now I'm pretty good at. I'm pretty comfortable with not having to kill anyone. Now, I don't, don't take deer hunting away from me. <laughs> Chris Carl, thanks so much. Thank you.